Welcome back to What You Need to Know with Mark Hour. Today is April 19th. Today is Good Friday. And uh, the conversation today is taxes. America does pay enough. I read something the other day, or heard it rather, in Apple News, and it said Americans don't pay enough taxes. Well, I'm going to interject my own opinions and uh, bring together some reality and uh, talk you through some of the aspects of our system and the disorder thereof. Uh, but first, let's open in prayer. Uh, we're going to read Samuel, 1 Samuel verses 8 through 11, and uh, we're going to talk about how we got ourselves into this situation. Man's role. So God loves, and I'm reading this from Anger Management, The Lord's Way, by myself, page 145, Man's Role. God loves, and when he is rejected, he forgives and makes new agreements. Let's go and moves beyond. That is Anger Management, The Lord's Way. Exodus chapters 19 through 35 teach how after being delivered from bondage in Egypt, the nation Israel was in God's direct care. God brought them to Mount Sinai to ratify an agreement with all 600,000 men, not counting the women, children, and livestock. God's presence was too intense for the people to handle. And while Moses was with God on the mountaintop and memorializing the agreement, the people became restless and made a golden calf to worship. Moses' intimacy with God saved the people. God continued to make and ratify his covenant agreement with them after much deliberation with Moses. God continued to lead the nation Israel through intercessors and priests up through Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, the crux of this conversation, the establishment of the monarchy of Israel is retold. An extremely critical point in history because once again, God is rejected. This time, Israel asks for a king, like those of the Gentile nations, justifying their request by rejecting sons of their priest Samuel. Our infinitely gracious Father in heaven grants their request with one condition. Samuel conveys the following message prior to God letting go and moving beyond. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked of him a king. He said, This will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties, and some to do his plowing and to reap his harvest, and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. Now do you hear this? Take, 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 right? He will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He will also take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his servants. Then you will cry out in the day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. That's 1 Samuel chapter 8 verses 10 through 18. Now, why did I choose that? Today's Good Friday, right? Today is the holiest of days in Christianity. It's when Jesus himself is rejected. We just read when God was rejected, his father was rejected at Mount Sinai. And he gives us a king. And he tells us, hey, you know what? Y'all are just going to be slaves on the plantation. Everything that's yours is no longer yours. It's going to become the king's. He told us in plain language. He had Samuel read it over to us to make sure we knew what we were getting into. So if you think you have a grudge and you got a problem bottom line is is this is a contract okay we've been in the contract for a long time and when christ died in our stead on good friday the contract was broken he pays our debts he pays for our sins what in of itself death is a tax death is a tax for our behavior in the garden through our ancestry okay ancestral sin 
that's the ultimate tax. Hey, you know what? If you eat of the tree of the fruit, you know, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you sure shall surely die. So that's a tax. That's for the behavior. And so Christ himself pays for our taxes, pays that tax on the cross, right? So we don't have to pay for it anymore. We will not surely die for eternity. We will live. So I'm going to pray for mercy for rejecting God our Father in heaven over and over. We rejected God. I can count at least six times when we've rejected God. And he just keeps coming back. He keeps coming back in love to establish a relationship with us. A couple of times just that, just to help you understand that would be uh, in the garden. Okay, we rejected him. He ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We rejected him at Mount Sinai. Just read about that. We rejected him, Christ and his person. Not only did we reject Jesus, but we you know, flogged him, we accused him, uh, and we murdered him. Seriously, we rejected him. We reject him now, you know, in this present day, in this moment, this minute, right now on the planet. How many billion people are living their lives in absolute rejection of God? No, he doesn't exist. But what does God do? He loves us. Yeah, he loves us. And then there's other instances in history as well. Heavenly Father, I pray today, arms outspread and total dependence on your goodness, your grace, and your love. Not judging other people, not condemning other people, not pointing out the, the failures of other people. None of that. None of that. Because I myself am a sinner. I am broken, pissed off. I don't like the situation. Don't like how people handle their decision making and how it impacts me, my family, and your loved ones, especially the most vulnerable, the ones who are just barely eking out a living, who basically have to beg. So Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for Jesus, his infinite mercy, and your love and your infinite mercy and your ability to overlook our short-sightedness, our self-centeredness, our you know, using stuff to fill the void in our hearts, using whatever it is, you know, work, alcohol, love, sex, money, stuff, toys, just packing that empty spot in our hearts with whatever basically crap we choose to pack into our hearts and 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 reject you and just you know don't even like give you the time in the day to think of you jesus christ thank you for loving us looking down from the cross knowing our mental illness and still forgiving us and bringing us home to your heavenly father in your name jesus in unity with the holy spirit love and the creation and the energy of your heavenly father i pray amen i'm going to talk a little bit about taxes this is my own personal tax information so i'm going to put it out there just because people say we don't pay enough in taxes so i'm just going to read a litany of lists that my wife and i paid in tax for 2018 it's by line item, so you have to forgive me. 33,661 federal income tax, 9,488 real estate taxes, 6,592 state tax, another 335 in state tax, another $3,330 in state tax, $4,550 in federal tax, $4,466 in social security tax, $3,450 in federal tax, $1,044 in Medicare tax, $7,644 in Social Security tax, $1,787 in Medicare tax, $2,211 in state income tax. Okay, so that totals $82,774 in tax. That does not include sales and use tax, motor vehicle tax, fuel tax, taxes on our utilities, taxes on our phones, or the 1.95% local uh, earned income tax, uh, which was another $4,251. And then if we count what we contributed to our own healthcare costs, another $17,400, it's a total of $100,144 taxes paid on 256,000 gross income. So what's wrong with America? Because in addition to the taxes we paid, we have a debt that's not paid, okay? That's perpetuated upon us 
our children, and our grandchildren. Because, let's face it, deficit spending is reality. Deficit spending in my household, yeah, I borrowed. I didn't make enough money last year. I borrowed. Okay, that doesn't include food, that doesn't include utilities, that doesn't include, you know, the crap that we buy every day. That's just tax. $100,144 in taxes. So, America, wake up. We pay enough in tax. We pay for our own health care costs most of the time. And, you know, like we have a $4,000, you know, deductible and then an 80% coverage. So, you know, hello. All right, so why is deficit spending a problem? Because in relationship to the economy, when you have access to credit, okay, whether it's on a government level, a local level, you know, your own personal in leveraging your future, okay, as far as income is concerned, when you access credit or amortize or use your future income, like a mortgage for 30 years, you exasperate pricing. There's a relationship, it's called price elasticity. And as long as money is available, okay, and the demand continues, prices will go up in relationship to, you know, purchasing power. And I could go into price elasticity or inelasticity or blah, 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 but we're just going to keep it really simple. When we borrow, we create the problem like deficit spending, passing on the burden of those additional taxes onto the future, mortgaging our future. We're slaves. Okay, and we're going to go back to Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, 11. God himself said, hey, you know what? You're not going to want me in your life. I'm cool with that. But bear in mind, you're going to be slaves. Slaves. So if you feel like you have a right to condemn any government or anybody, you know, for your relationship and your anxiety, you kind of do, but you don't because we gave that right up. And you don't, if you're not aware of those contracts and those agreements, then you're ignorant. And ignorance doesn't necessarily mean that you're out of the, out of the loop. It just means that you're ignorant. So I'm gonna read you uh, something out of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual uh, regarding anxiety disorders and generalized anxiety disorders. So if you, know, you don't have enough money, you uh, feel the pain of indebtedness and slavery, you're working seven days a week and you leverage your future uh, wages and income uh, to get by. So why would generalized anxiety disorder be important? Because if we're kept awake at night by our worries, that's a problem. On page 436 of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual in uh, the DSM-4 by the American Psychiatric Association, they describe generalized anxiety disorder. So, 300.02. The anxiety and worry are associated with three or more of the following six symptoms, with at least one symptom present for more than you know, a few days, but not lasting more than six months. Note, only one item is required in children. One, restlessness or feeling keyed up or on edge. Well, I think all of America is like that. Two, being easily fatigued. I'm not easily fatigued. I work seven days a week, but I feel fatigued. Three, difficulty concentrating or mind going blank. Well, yeah, no, that happens to me, and I'm sure if you're <clears throat> human, you, and it happens to you at least once in a while. Irritability, that's four. I'm a cantankerous old man, or at least I'm becoming one, because I'm tired of the ignorance in our leadership. Five, muscle tension. Yeah, I feel that. Six, sleep disturbance. Difficulty falling or staying asleep, or restless, unsatisfying sleep. Well, I'm probably not sleep enough. I'm getting less than six hours, so. And then D, the focus of the anxiety and worry is not confined to features of an axis one disorder example giving the ax anxiety or worry is not about having a panic attack as in panic disorder or being embarrassed in public as in social phobia being contaminated as in obsessive compulsive disorder being away from home or close relatives as in separation anxiety disorder or gaining weight as in anorexia nervosa having multiple physical complaints as in somatization disorder or having a serious illness as in hypochondriasis and the anxiety and worry do not occur exclusively during post-traumatic stress disorder. 
and then E, the anxiety, worry, or physical symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. And then F, the disturbance, disturbance is not due to the direct physiological effects of a substance. Like example, given a drug of abuse, a medication, or a general medical condition, hyperthyroidism, and does not occur exclusively during a mood disorder, a, psychi a, a psychotic disorder, or a pervasive developmental disorder. It's enough of that. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm going to pray for uh, relief of any anxiety for you and your loved ones and anybody else out there on the planet. We need our prayers. We've asked for our prayers. We have no one to pray for them. You know, Jesus, my Lord and my Savior, you stole precious time away to commune with your Heavenly Father in the woods, away from everybody, to collect yourself and to re-energize become one again with your father and the love that exists in relationship that you feel with your father. So thank you, Jesus, for teaching us to quiet ourselves and to retreat, if you will, to relax and to become less, to say, hyper aware of uh, what we're worried about and just to pray and commune with you and your heavenly father through the power of the holy spirit and give you our worries and give you our calamities and give you our struggles and to give you our situations like paying a hundred thousand one hundred forty four dollars in taxes that doesn't include sales tax or gasoline tax or any of the other taxes that are collected on a regular basis through our utility payments and food payments and and yet, you know, it's not enough and the system continues to overburden us, overburden us, overburden us and enslave us with additional debt, additional debt, additional debt. And then have the audacity to say, hey, we don't pay enough. We don't pay enough. No, it's a better system. Raise taxes. So, uh, Jesus, thank you for giving us the ability to just retreat away from that nonsense, that illogical thought process. The level of understanding is beyond comprehension. We just give it to you, Jesus. Give it to you because you see it, you know it, and it's not up to us to judge, condemn, or attack. Just give it to you. You know, you'll work it out. You're the author and the creator of everything. So if there's calamity and ignorance and stupidity and anger and all kinds of attacks going on, if we give our dilemma to you, you will straighten it out. You will bring knowledge to the forefront of the minds of the individuals who have the power and the capability to correct the imbalances. We ask these things in your name, Jesus, and your Heavenly Father, in total understanding that it's already done. You did it on the cross. It's paid. The debts are paid. If we just took the accounting that's off ledger within the Treasury of the United States and then allocated the uh, the worth of the country to every citizen alive as an inheritance that's already been paid for by our ancestry, we're all billionaires. So don't fret. They want to hoodwink us, but they're not going to, you know, because Christ has paid. Christ has paid our debt. You know, try not to make decisions in the in the moment where you're leveraging your future future capital or credit or whatever, because it also exasperates pricing. Uh, it enables the system to continue to raise prices and just you know take take take. And in that regard, later on when we go to pay for it with interest is actually a task a tax as well oh by the way uh, i paid sixteen thousand one hundred seventy eight dollars in interest last year on my mortgage which is a tax because i can't afford to pay cash for my house so i have to leverage my future income so they tax me on that as well so i paid sixteen thousand one hundred seventy eight dollars in tax or interest on my my home in closure god our father our heavenly father who warned us warned us that the king and subsequent rulers would enslave us, have our sons run out in front of chariots. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for always wanting us to be sovereign. Thank you for always treating us as your, your beloved, your children, bought and paid and purchased by the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your son, Jesus. 
death is no longer a tax on our behavior, our, ancest our ancestral sin. Understand that we understand the cause and effect relationships because you laid it out for us. You have given us a roadmap to mental health. We can't change the world we live in. We can have trouble changing our own behaviors, let alone the behaviors of others. And the borrow from Martha Stout, PhD, in quoting uh, Voltaire, minds differ still more than faces. So why, Heavenly Father, you know, do we fight? We do that in vanity, and we, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for accepting us and loving us and treating us as your children, as your beloved, and providing for us clean water, clean air, and thank you, Jesus, um, families and love, and a holiday where we can remember you know, our debts are paid in full by your son, Jesus. And that's, you know, and that, and just to be sure, Heavenly Father, we want everybody to understand the cause and effect relationships. And you know that we, you know, there's no way we can get to heaven on our own through our own behaviors. You know, we failed miserably in time and millennium. So you gave us an opportunity to embrace your love through your son. That's what it is. It's love. It's not condemnation of others. It's not rejection of others. It's not a beratement of others. It's just accepting and acknowledging your love you bestowed upon us through your son and to model our behaviors after. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.